Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Andre Martin with Divine Truth Christian Center, where God wants your dreams and visions realized. Once again, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it's nice to see everyone on this wonderful and blessed time. Um, what I would like to do is I actually would like to um, talk about a couple of things in regards to um, um, the church, um, what it is, what it's all about, and the like. And so as we begin to go forward, um, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We honor you, Lord God, and we bless your holy name. We thank you for your kindness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, Lord God, for these, your people. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you touch them and that you um, move upon their hearts during this time. We thank you, Lord God, for your kindness, your mercy, and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And so on this particular evening, we're going to actually be talking about the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, um, there is a um, lot of information in regards to um, the ministry that Jesus Christ um, gave to the disciples during that particular time. And so it is very important that uh, people actually understand what is going on, that people actually um, um, know what the church stands for what it um, um, the values it has um, inherently and the like and so what I wanted to do on this particular evening is that I actually wanted to uh, talk about a couple of things in regards to this and so as we move um, um, forward um, let's um, explore a couple of things about Jesus so when we talk about Jesus we have to first of all we have to understand this one fact that um, as we kind of go back into last week and, and as we kind of propel over into um, this particular week, number one is that Jesus is God. Jesus is God's ultimate solution for all humanity, um, Jews and Gentiles alike. And so when we talk about that and we're talking about how um, um, we see the person of Jesus Christ uh, bodily, this is not something to where he's just a prophet only, but he actually truly is God. We see this testified in the scriptures. The second point that I want to um, share with you is number two, is that he actually represents God and is um, 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 is responsible for carrying, carrying God's plan for humanity. God's plan for humanity is basically broken down into um, um, two simple facts, um, redemption and reconciliation. Redemption basically means that God is redeeming um, man back from his uh, once um, 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 glorious state which was representative inside of the garden and so when we look at this it is very important for um, everybody to understand is that when you actually look at the representation of Jesus Christ and how he was actually there to promote things in regards to um, 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 life and, 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 and godliness and salvation it all started with redeeming mankind he is also noted as the second man Adam that's the very first fact and then the second piece is reconciliation. When we talk about reconciliation, there's this nuisance, um, this detrimental thing that also happened in the garden, which was the introduction um, of sin due to man's own choices. This is where free will actually comes into play. And so as a result of this, um, man came into um, contact with its, his first um, choice or a series of, he had a series of choices because, you know, he gave the animals names. He talked about different types of places. He even understood his helpmate and the like. But then when it came to a choice between light and darkness, um, God said, I want you to choose light, but I have to give you a certain level of autonomy. And so because of the choice to go against God, then we are left with a situation to where, hey, guess what? Well, I can't really um, follow God in the way that I like, so I'm going to make my own choice and I'm going to gravitate towards darkness versus light. Some people like to see, um, 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 look at evil as an actual entity or Satan is actually the equivalent to evil, but Satan is not the equivalent to evil. Satan committed acts of evil. People commit acts of evil and committing the acts of evil. I did a nice little blog post um, a little while ago talking about the nature of good and evil. And evil is actually the, um, the essence of evil is, is basically summed up in this way. When you distance yourself away from God and away from the light, then there's a certain series of um, effects that happen to, to a, a person. Um, number one, it's almost like a flower that is being hidden away from the sun. 
when a flower is being taken away from the sun, then it begins to wither and die. But then when it comes into the sunlight, if you will, and it gets its proper nourishment, then it begins to bloom and get lighter. And so same thing goes when it comes to humans. Humans were designed by God um, as part of his creation to stay close to him, to stay in and walk in the light. When we're in the light, of course, our deeds are going to be illuminated, both good and bad. But it's better to struggle with God than without God. But when you push away from the table or when you um, um, push away from God or you never come to God in the first place because you're unaware of light or the light actually repels you, then basically what ends up happening is, is that you want to push away from the light and you begin to wither and die and you get begin to go into a, an effect or a series of, um, 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 of situations to where um, you become one with the darkness or dark elements begin to get into your soul. That's why you see certain things being said, such as, OK, well, um, your soul is being darkened or um, um, your eyes look like they have death within them and the like. But all of those things are tertiary effects of um, no longer being in the light. And so Jesus, our Lord and Savior, um, was there to help reconcile the fact that we can have a relationship with God again. There were two angels that were sitting at the um, at the exit, if you will, of the Garden of Eden, and they had flaming swords that basically um, went in every single direction, like balls of fire, if you will. Just like you had two cherubs that was going to be on the ark of the uh, or on the um, the veil, if you will, um, that stood in front of the holy of holies before the priest actually went in, basically guarding the way, um, symbolically speaking, an ark, but physically and spiritually speaking as far as the garden they basically let man know that you're not going to be able to get back and right standing with god based on your own decision or based on your own way you can leave your own way but you cannot um, come back to god your own way when people try to get back to god their own way they basically did what i would call create religions that's how that was man's attempt to be able to get back in contact with God because it's almost like you trying to get in touch with a father that you've never met. You don't even know where to go. You don't know how to do it. So sometimes what people do is that they try to emulate what that person would be like and they try to find them. And sometimes you find other alternatives instead of the actual real thing. And so what Jesus did was when he came, he came, died, buried, was rose uh, again on the third day. When he came, he came in the embodiment um, of flesh to basically give man a hint that, hey, this is exactly how I want you to act. This is how I want you to be. But because I know that you have sinned and you can't do these things inherently, then um, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to sacrifice my life um, um, for you because um, you don't want me by default. So I have to show you love. In other words, as the scripture says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And then finally, Jesus also makes it possible for God's mission to save his creation to be fulfilled. And that's where the reconciliation portion comes from. And you can find those in um, um, in the scriptures as far as Acts chapter 16, verse 31. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Or as I like to um, point out when it comes to the um, um, to the actual, um, oh, hey Stanley, how you doing my brother? Um, what the other part that I actually like to point to, which is um, Romans chapter 10, verse nine and 10, which is, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that he rose again from the dead, then you will be saved. But you can't just say those things like we sometimes errantly do as preachers to let people have a um, sinner's prayer. No, God has to regenerate your heart. You have to have a response. Some people like to get into the whole Arminian and Calvinistic type of thing and even Molinist, um, Molinist thing, which is, you know, having a choice of either both and and or either God chooses you or or you choose God. Either way, God is the one that does the regeneration of the heart, even to allow for you to even make a choice to go against him. And so with that being said, you can't even say Romans 10 authentically, verse 9 and 10 authentically unless he has saved you first. And so because of Jesus, you have the ability to actually be able to do that. So let's move on a little bit further. The next piece that we have when it comes to Jesus as we close on this particular phase and then move into the next phase is this. Number one, as Lord, he sent followers as ambassadors to carry on his will to spread the good news that the kingdom of God actually has come. And so this is also extremely important um, when it comes to what our role is as far as the church is concerned. 
our role is not just to, I put a nice little teasing uh, thing online today. Um, I did a, a couple of my pastor friends, Pastor Dan Stanley Murray, um, as well as uh, Bishop Larry Carter, and I tagged them in this nice little post, funny post about, man, I really miss coming to ch uh, church late. <laughs> it was so funny to me. But as believers, we our goal is not just to come to church um, only. It's for us to actually be the church. And I think this is where a major disconnect is when it comes to believing in the things of God. And so, um, yes, Samantha, I definitely will give you a pair of requests for sure. Just put it inside of the chat and I will address it towards the end. And so when it comes to um, being the church, um, and I'll just use this particular prayer request as an example, as a, as as believers of Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are not just to sit idly by. Even under this situation, when it comes to the coronavirus, we are not supposed to just sit idly by and then just pray and then just do nothing else. We have to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit the widows, the jailhouses, and the prisons. We had somebody that just asked earlier, hey, do you, do you deliver food to the sick and shut-ins? Um, do you... Um, 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 fulfill prayer requests? Are there people that um, are around that can actually assist um, um, those that are downtrodden? And is there anyone who can actually fill the gaps, maybe not necessarily monetarily or funds are concerned, but is there somebody that I could talk to um, because I have anxiety, depression, or despair? Well, that's what the church is. And once again, Jesus um, as Lord, he sent followers. We are followers of Jesus Christ. We're not just simply Christians. Christians is, is not even a derogatory term. It's just a way that the um, ancient Romans actually described um, who we were at that particular time because they figured, hey, we follow Christ, Christ, Christians. It sounds logical to me. So that's what you are. But it's more than just being called a Christian. It's not just what type of title that you have, but it's actually what you do. In other words, as St. Francis of Assisi said, he says, speak the gospel, preach the gospel, but use words um, if necessary. So this is where we get into the thematic view of the actual church. So what is the church? Um, the church is the body of Christ. Why do we use, or why is that particular term used, the body of Christ? And we talk about this physical body. Well, this is an example, if you will, of a physical body. Now, physical body is um, something that um, we all have, thank God, but there is parts of the body. You have hands, you have arms, you have chest, you have a head. But when it comes to the body of Christ, we don't look at it as an organization. Um, a lot of people, young people on, on Facebook and even on social media um, usually say specific things such as, well, you know, the church is just a business. Yes, it is a business. It's a kingdom business. It's not just about um, trying to sell you something. Now, a secular person who has no um, spiritual um, um, compass within, they'll see the church just as um, they would see the Red Cross or they would see the church just as um, a soup kitchen only. But the church is much more than that. That's why Jesus described us as his body. In other words, we're the arms, um, legs, feet and, um, and, and, and of Christ. In other words, we do the work. Um, that's why I said the quote earlier about St. Francis Assisi that said, uh, preach the gospel and use words if necessary. In other words, we are the action. Jesus has already given his word. He's the embody of the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. That dwelling among us anthropomorphically speaking or human speaking is talking about Jesus. But now Jesus has now ascended to the right hand of the father making intercession for us. And so as a result of that, he has already given us his instructions. So once again, when we think about the church, the church represents um, a number of believers. In the book of Acts, the number of believers grew from out of house churches and Acts or the book of Acts actually summarizes the life of this particular community. And Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 43, it says the following, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So at the very elementary level, we need to understand that um, the apostles teaching is not some type of um, esoteric type teaching that no one knows about. This is on full display. That's why the scripture is sola scriptura, meaning that we look at scripture alone. We don't look at scripture plus 
other things only as, as far as our authoritative source. We can look at other things as a, a, an authoritative source. We can look at um, other books and ideas, magazines and articles and the like, but those things should still point back to the scriptures. I can't write a book and say this is more authentic to the scriptures like some other faith traditions do. As Christians, as Bible believing um, Christians that believe um, in the Latin term sola scriptura or scripture alone, we believe that the Bible is final authority. And so when the apostles are talking about how um, these people or these followers after Jesus ascended to the Father are around, who are they supposed to be led by? They're led by the 12 apostles minus one, which was Judas that betrayed um, Jesus on that dark and fateful day. And so those teachings, which you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the like by Bartholomew, the Sons of Thunder, all of these different apostles that actually died very untimely and very horrible deaths in order to um, um, promote the gospel, those teachings are not their teachings. Those teachings are what I would call a firsthand echo from the master himself, or the master teacher himself, Jesus. That's why when we talk about apostles, what, do, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about the apostles from today? The apostles from today are not like the apostles of Jesus Christ. That particular portion of the scripture or the canon is closed. There are no apostles of Jesus Christ. There are apostles after the tradition of Barnabas, not even after the tradition of Paul, because Paul saw Jesus Christ as a Christophany in his glorified body, the same glorified body that you see, eyes of fire, hair, white like wool, not hair like wool, like some other um, groups like to um, purport. Um, but that spiritual image is what Paul saw on the road to Damascus. And because of that, he was now qualified to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. The apostles that you see today, their teaching should also fall in line with what the scriptures actually say. Not because you've been in ministry for 40 years and now you feel like you need to be promoted because there is nowhere else to go. Um, no, the true apostles of today are more like missionaries and missionaries are there to, once again, be a further echo of the singular voice, which is what God spoke about through his scriptures moving right along and so in our next phase we're going to be talking about the characteristics of the church when we look at the characteristics of the church there's basically five different areas if you will there's the mission there's baptism there's worship there is fellowship and then instruction repeating once again there is the mission of the church what the church is actually supposed to be doing not what you think it is not a big high steeple few people or a a, a big box um and a big box um, um, um building with thousands of thousands of people no those are just holding places it's the people themselves and they have a mission the mission is to preach the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, not only verbally, but also in um, action. Okay, we can't now, you see that that's, there's a, um, a, a, a dynamic there. There's a, 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 a specific partnership right there. You can't just have the word only and no action or else you're just a sounding board. You can't just have all action and no word or else you're just a community service organization. There's some people who just say preach the word only and then they don't do anything in their community. And so we have um, uh, many different generations that look at that skeptically and be like, well, you know, Jesus did a whole bunch of work just within three years. At the same time, we can't go to the other extreme and say, hey, you're just a community service organization only. And as a community service organization, then you don't need to preach the gospel. You don't need to say anything about Jesus Christ. You need to leave that off the table. You know, separation church and state, a lot of the things that sometimes secular government wants us to do. And we can't do that. So we have a specific mission. There's also baptism, which talks about ordinances, worship, fellowship and instruction. So let's break down. Um, a couple of them started with uh, baptism. Now, when we look at baptism, baptism, and we're talking about the ordinance of the church, if you will. Hey, uh, Sister uh, Wesley, um, how you doing? Hope Feaster, how you doing? Uh, uh, I love the uh, great woman of God. And so um, one of the things I wanted to talk about in, like, um, in regards to baptism, when we think about baptism, baptism is an ordinance. Repeat after me, ordinance. An ordinance is what I would call a tradition or an ancient church tradition that is supposed to symbolize a couple of things. First of all, it represents a powerful symbol um, of the character and identity of the church. In other words, people in the new community of believers, once they are saved, um, are 
um, baptized, if you will, basically two ways. The first way is externally. In other words, it's a, it's a sign or outward. Let me reverse that. The first way, as it should be, should be internally. There should be something on the inside of you that makes you want to serve God and love God. I got a quick story for you. Um, those of you that may know me, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and I went to, um, um, and I grew up um, in a church, a Baptist church called uh, First Baptist Church of Oakland, um, affectionately called the Oak. And at that time, my um, pastor at that time was Reverend Charles C.B. Dale. I still remember the church address, 1025 Jesse Street, Jacksonville, Florida, Northwest Quadrant of Jacksonville. And so at that particular time, I liked going to church. Um, I was a little bit of a troublemaker because I used to like to ask questions that uh, used to stump uh, my uh, Sunday school teachers and make them mad, um, if you will. And, and I'll talk about some other details of that at a later date. But um, there was one particular moment in time where I got swept up in the quote unquote church moment. There would be people that I would see that would go to the front of the aisle and used to uh, walk down um, the aisle and people start clapping and I didn't really understood why but people would start clapping and it would go all the way to the front of the um, building to the altar area at that particular time and um, somebody because the preacher was basically saying hey will you come will you come there's um, uh, <laughs> millions have come there's root still room for all that yes there's room at the cross for you it was a nice little hymnal going forward people walk up to the front people start clapping I was like man that's a good way to get watch this it here's in my eyes as a 14 year old young man that is a good way to get attention it looks like you become popular after you get saved <laughs> But then what ended up happening is, is that I got swept up in the moment. I was like, you know what? I want to go too. I remember my sister going, I remember my brother going, and I, and I wanted to go too. And I think I was one of the first ones to go. So I went too, and I got to the front. Um, Reverend Daly asked me, he was like, son, why'd you come? And I said, well, he said, why do you want to be baptized? Why do you want to be saved? And I said, because I love the Lord so innocently. But, and it was so great. They set a date for me. I still remember coming there in the evening time with a white gown on. It was a uh, very few people, so that kind of disappointed me. I was like, man, I thought there was going to be a whole bunch of people that's going to show up to my baptism because I thought it was popular. I thought it was the thing to do. So I got baptized. First of all, um, I liked it because, number one, you got attention. Think about me being a 14-year-old young man, right? Number one, I thought that you were going to be popular, and there's going to be people that could look at you as you're walking down the aisle. So I was attention-seeking at that time. That's just me thinking back. And then another part that I like is, is that they had a pool <laughs> and it looked like a pool and we didn't have no pools at that particular time. So I wanted to get in the pool. And so I got in the water. I thought it was going to be warm. No, it was ice cold. I got out in the water. There was, when I came from up out of the water, the sensation was going all over my body. I felt uh, shivers down my spine. And the truth of the matter was, is that I was just cold. <laughs> and then that was it. A um, couple of days later, I went outside. I was looking up at the sky. I was like, I really feel good right now. But then what ended up happening was, is that um, the moral of the story is, is that I had an external um, transformation, but not an internal one. Because years later, as time went by, I began to question the scriptures. I began to question the Bible. I didn't believe it was real. I believed that there was more than one way to get to God. I started to get into um, um, Masonic type things. No disrespect for those of you that don't. Um, um, see anything wrong with that but for me at that particular time that's what I got into became a mason when I was um, 19 years old in other words I became a full-throated Gnostic I even remember getting into arguments with my mother basically saying that Jesus is not the only way to God and the Bible is just one of the ways that you can get to God I'm not saying that you you know just like some of the young people say today I, I didn't I'm not against the Bible I'm just saying that there's more than one path because I thought that I was enlightened not even understanding that enlightenment means that i came up with my own light from the inside which we all understand that man can't just come up with their own light from the inside only light that emits from out of a man outside of the holy spirit is darkness but that's what i was thinking intellectually speaking and so i get further and further away from god when i got to college as a young man i went to one church everybody's laughing all over the place that was my first introduction to charismatic um charismania and I was like, I'll never set foot in the church ever again. And I didn't for six years because I was in the extended college program. For six years, I never set foot back into a church unless it was a community service event. And that was it. And so I had an external experience, but not an internal experience. That's why being baptized does not save you. 
not externally, not just dipping down in the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Woo! Some big ladies sing that in the background. To be baptized. And that's all that I thought that it was. But then when I turned 26 years old, I got baptized on the inside. Even Jesus spoke about it um, um, some time ago. He said, you know, you guys come down here with your whitewashed robes and you look so nice and clean. If I were to put that in contemporary terms, you come here with your Stacey Adams shirts, uh, um, your suits and your Stacey Adams shoes. If you're on a budget, I'm just teasing. Or you come up here with your Armani suits and the like or your Burberry cloths and, and Louis Vuitton um, 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 bags. And you're walking around with your um, um, head up high, looking down your ecclesiastical noses like your peacocks in God zoo. But on the inside, you're like dead man's bones. In other words, it's death in there. You're a Pharisee, you're a Sadducee. On the outside, you look like you have piety and you look like you are um, a faith-filled person. But on the inside, you're dead. You're unresponsive. Compassion does not move you. And so when I got truly saved, this brings up the patches of scripture, which says that... Um, I, yeah, John, baptized, yeah, he baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That means that there was something that was burning on the inside. That burning on the inside is not just the zeal or just having the energy to want to, um, how should I say, just do things for the church. But the fire that was on the inside also represents burning up sin, burning up impurities, illuminating flaws, turning on the flashlight, finding out about the weaknesses that I have as a person, some that I could pray away, some that could not be prayed away because they were a thorn in my side that the enemy has placed there to buffet me, to let me know that, hey, you're a human and you're always going to be or have this element of body of death. For those of you that are not familiar with that term, if you will, body of death, we are always going to be um, um, battling as saved people, even as a person who is baptized internally with our flesh. That body of death represents the actual flesh. And so baptism is more than just you dipping into the water, just like I did, just wanting to get into a pool or just wanting to be seen. It's actually um, has the inverse effect when you are saved for real. When you are saved for real, the actual inverse effect makes you not want to be seen. It makes you uh, want to go into a hiding place because you got tears in your eyes and you when you do something wrong, it actually is more conviction versus condemnation. Condemnation pushes you away from God. Conviction actually pulls you towards God. So that's baptism. Um, Acts chapter two, verse 38 says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is an ordinance that was an outward declaration of an inward truth. You get what I'm saying? It was an outward declaration of an inward truth. Let's move on a little bit. So that was the first piece of the circle. Now, the second piece is worship. Oh, my goodness. I love worship. My wife is a worship leader, been a worship leader in our church. And even um, um, for many for many years in our ministry, um, and also throughout her life, great worship leader. And one of the things that my wife is learning about as she goes through her um, um, continuing education in regards to worship is, is basically a couple of things. Number one, she is learning as well as what we have taught um, 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 throughout the years that worship is a visual de declaration of our deepest beliefs. In other words, I'll give you another example. What you... Um, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You ever heard that scripture before? You ever heard that saying before? I'll give you a contemporary example. If you look at your receipts, you'll see what you're most invested in. All right. If you are a saved person, I'm not talking about somebody who just goes to church like Christmas, Mother's Day and Easter, you know, don't, no disrespect to that. But I'm not talking about just occasional people that just go because somebody made them or because it's just out of religious perfunction or there's nowhere else to go. I'm talking about people who are truly saved. When you are truly saved and you look at your receipt book and you, you should see that there should be some contributions to the body of Christ because you got to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the widows, jail houses, or prison. And that takes resources, just like our COVID-19 relief. In order for us to be able to do those things out in the community, we need resources, just not going to come from out of the sky. 
But neither here nor there. The main point of it is, is that when you worship God and when you praise God, you're led outside of yourself. You're led to a deeper fellowship with him because just like those receipts where you see what you're most heavily invested in, God is like, I don't want any other gods before me. So all those things that you're heavily invested in, I'm getting invested in kids' sports, I'm invested in um, 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 my hobbies, I'm invested in all these specific things. I want it to be to where when God looks at my receipt book, not only monetarily, but also as he's written down things in um, his um, um, book of life, that I want him to not only see just good conduct, but I also want him to see the actions or the acts that I have done. Not to get on this good side, not to generate something to get saved or anything like that, when you're saved, there's certain actions that you're supposed to commit after the fact. So I'm not trying to get on God's good side when I'm talking about just good acts or good deeds. Good deeds don't save you. When you get saved, you begin to do better or really do good deeds. You get what I'm saying? Good deeds don't save you, but when you get saved, you start doing good deeds. And so as a result of that, um, that worship, uh, as uh, Lady Mark just chimed in on the thing, says worship is actually a lifestyle. I preached a message many years ago. It's something that you actually do. Your conduct behind closed doors. Your character or who you really are is behind closed doors. So worship is more than you just raising your hands only and just swaying back and forward. It's beautiful. I love seeing congregations do it. It almost represents the voice of many waters. People look just like water. Everything is like water when people are swaying back and forth. This is a very beautiful scene. But the truth of the matter is, is that worship is truly a lifestyle. Also in worship, we express with our whole beings what is most important to us. So what is most important to you? You can't make your children an idol because they're going to get married or they're going to get out of their house and they're going to move on with their own their lives. So you can't make them your life and you can't worship them. Amen, somebody. You can't worship your job because jobs change as we have found out, right? You can't even worship when it comes to um, your friends or your social circles, because even in this particular pandemic that we're in, we find out that those things are all temporary. Only what you do for Christ will last. And so when we look at those particular things, we see that when we put God first in the way that we live, then it really means a lot. I see Sister Sharon, which is also one of our worship leaders. Hey, Sharon, how you doing? It also means obedience to God. Now, that's a big thing. I preached a message uh, many years ago called The Formula. And the formula for a believer or a true Christian is this. is There's two parts to the equation. It's um, faith and obedience. You can have faith that moves mountains, but if you don't do nothing that God says, then you're canceling yourself out. <laughs> On the flip side of that, you can have all the obedience in the world and you could just do things strictly to the letter. But if you have no faith, then you're only going to go so as far, only go as far as what is before your eyes. When you walk with God, there's going to come a point in time to where you're not going to have the evidence lay out before you. Just like when Moses parted the Red Sea, the children of Israel were able to see God move uh, before they did anything every step, step of the way. But things like that are not going to always take place in our uh, current time. Sometimes we have to be like Joshua to where we have to move, fir move first. We have to step out first. We have to go towards um, the promise first, fight first, and then God will show up. And so it's very important that we understand that worship is a true and complete lifestyle. It is part of the formula, which is faith and obedience. It's important to us. It's more than song. But it's also an element of song. It's a true act of obedience because sometimes you just want to keep your hands down and just don't want to do anything. In other words, your problems are so magnified to the point that you don't even want to say anything. You just want to be like, man, I'm just going to think about this text message. I'm thinking about my baby daddy that just sent me something. I'm thinking about my baby mama, how she stressed me out, how she's going to take me to court for the fourth time in order to elevate my child support. Or some, my repo man is coming. That text messages should not steal our praise. It shouldn't steal our worship. And so what you do when you truly worship God over those particular situations, over those circumstances, that is like you truly honoring one of the bedrock Ten Commandments, which is you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, or to not have any other gods before him. In other words, you're putting God first. You're abided by Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, which says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and all these things, the accoutrements, the amenities will be added unto you. If it is in his will, that's the caveat there. That's the qualifier there. Lastly, when it comes to worship, worship is also a humbling experience uh, where we recognize our ultimate dependence on God. Uh, how many of you know that there's been some true worship that's been going on across the country and across the world? Um, even in China, uh, where where I used to believe growing up, where there was no 
people that were Christians in China growing up, and I thought everybody in China was going to hell. But then I found out that they have actually one of the largest churches in the world. And because of this persecution, because of this quarantine, they actually started growing even more. And many of you that are out there are actually growing in your faith as a result of the pressure or the extenuated circumstances that you didn't even count. And that is very important. And so it's our ultimate dependence on God. And watch this. When you get saved, you got to work on that. When you get saved, you can't just believe that, hey, this is just going to happen just because I just got out of the pool. And you may have had a total and sincere transformation um, internally, but that does not mean that you automatically do what I was just speaking about. It's not an automatic thing. It's a lifelong process. Enoch walked with God and God took him. But how long did Enoch walk with God? Was it a day? No, it was several years. It was several hundreds of years that he walked with God and then God took him good. Then God didn't allow for him to see death. Some people call that the old, one of the first examples of the old te Testament uh, rapture, if you will, that's like he took Elijah up to the third heaven. And so that ultimate uh, total dependence on God takes a lot of work, a lot of work. This is what we call the fire part, the fire baptized. That's that fire that's burning up those impurities where I want to lean to my own flesh. I want to lean to my own desires versus leaning on God. Amen. So worship is so important. It's more than the song. But how many of you know that you can have a joyful noise coming from out of your mouth? Um, not only um, do we have our, our worship leaders uh, chiming in. Hey, Rick. Hey, uh, Ryan. Hey, everybody. How y'all are doing? Hey, Sister Chester, uh, my mother-in-law. How you doing? Worship is truly a lifestyle. Um, sometimes you just have to just get down on your knees or um, get on the side of the bed. Many times um, at night I go through securing the house, if you will, while everybody's going to sleep. And sometimes I just say, Lord, I thank you. And I don't have no worship music on. I don't have anything on. It's just me and having an intimate moment with God. Intimacy, um, when we talk about worship, it's almost like a husband and a wife coming together um, to make love with each other. It's not supposed to be brash. It's not supposed to be something that is abrasive. It's supposed to be something where you're totally disrobing yourself, not only physically, but also emotionally and spiritually before the other person in the one more moment. And then when you um, um, consummate that particular at that moment and at the consummate at that moment or that particular time, then usually what ends up happening is there's a release. There's a satisfaction that comes. You forget about all your problems. And if you climax, yes, I'm talking about a little bit of take the mic, if you will, marriage, intimacy and communication. Then what comes out of that in many instances is a child or something is being birthed if you will. That is in the natural. In the spirit, it's the same way. When you have total um, um, reliance on God and you come into an intimate place with him, we're not talking about carnal sexuality, if you will. That's just a symbol and type. That's just a, a visible example that somebody who is in the world and not saved, they could kind of really understand what that means. But what I'm talking about is, is that when you get in a total vulnerable place with God, like God, I don't know about you, but uh, I do not know what to do when it comes to this uh, corona that's out here. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my church. I don't know what to do when it comes to the people. I want to make sure the people are healthy and, uh, and are well, but I also want to make sure that we um, are able to pay our um, responsibilities to our landlord and the like. I want to still do ministry. Lord, help me. What am I supposed to do with this? And sometimes it just comes through worshiping and praising God in the midst of your situation, circumstances, in the midst of your tears, in the midst of you having a pink slip that's staring at you right in your face and be like, Lord God, what can I do with this? But still, what you're doing is, is that you're allowing for God to dominate your situation of circumstances. Sometimes there is a change and he's merciful and he'll bring you out of it. Sometimes you have to endure it and it's just a waiting game. As the old people would say, sometimes he, he may not come when you want to, but, but he's always right on time. Sometimes there's a delay. Sometimes it's immediate. No matter what, he has your life in his hands. And sometimes that praise has to come first before you get a breakthrough. And sometimes worship has to come first before you have a breakthrough. And I'm not talking about an all-night concert where you talk about, oh, Jesus, come out here and you foaming at the mouth. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, Lord God, I'm putting you first, whether it's in song, word, or deed. Even if it's at home, I'm putting you first in my life, I'm submitting all that I have to you. 
If you want to know how this uh, young man um, um, became successful in his life, coming from 1436 West 10th Street in Jacksonville, Florida, right across from Durkinville Projects, how did I come to where I am today? I promise you I wasn't the most sharpest brick in the barn. Didn't have the most uh, money. Um, didn't have the richest family. My secret to success, come closer. Come closer. Come closer. My secret to success is following God and working my faith to have total dependence on him. Not money, not how much I gave in the offering, none of those things. It's having total dependence on God when I didn't have anything. That is the secret to my success. And this is things that you learn as far as being a part of the church. Lady Martin says that praise is a weapon. So I'm going to go ahead and, and go on this. There's a song that came out many years ago that talks about praise is a weapon. Teach my hands to war. Praise is a weapon. It says praise confuses the enemy. And so what they used to do in the Old Testament when the enemy was beginning to come towards the children of Israel, one of the things that they used to do is that they would begin to clap in order to create echoes, in order to create confusion to make the army sound louder than what it really is. And so when the enemy heard all of this particular noise, oh, what in the world is going on here? It's almost like uh, what you see in some of those memes on Facebook would be like, oh, no, no, boo-boo. Go ahead and come on here right now. I got something for you. In other words, you are actually in a ready position in order to engage what the enemy is trying to assault you with. And so that praise, as Lady Martin said in the chat, is a truly a weapon. It's something that you can use in order to fight depression, in order to fight despair, in order to get your heart right and your mind fixed, and also to help you to put God first. See, they only help me to stay on that, but I got to move on to another element, which is so important. It's something that we all earnestly uh, yearn for, which is fellowship. Fellowship is so important. When we talk about fellowship in regards to the book of Acts, it's talking about a couple of things. Number one, it's talking about how you are not only congregating, but how you are with one mindset with fellow believers. There's many different local assemblies. Um, there's many different um, physical assemblies and many different church bodies. When we talk about fellowship. As a believer, you should be able to fellowship with anybody. I should be able to fellowship with you if you go to Northland. I should be able to fellowship with you if you go to OAC. I should be able to fellowship with you if I go to Mount Zion, if I go to um, 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 uh, uh, Living Waters Church, I should be able to fellowship with any number of these people because when you are truly the church, there is no competition, there is no um, 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 worried about you taking somebody else's members, none of those particular things. Um, you should, when you truly fellowship, you are secure within Christ. I could go around anybody and I could still go back to my local assembly because we're all in the same team, all right? And so true fellowship means this. It means when you get with other believers and as you get with other believers, true fellowship flows from our fellowship with God. So when you fellowship with God and you spend time with God, then you want to spend time with other people to share with them the good news, to encourage them, to exhort them, especially during dark times that we've gone through this year. There's also another piece right here. Um, it, fellowship also represents a time of communion. In the breaking of bread, likely... Um, includes the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Fellowship became central part of that community as we would see in Acts chapter 2 verse um, 42. Um, and let me break it down this way. The two elements of a Lord's Supper has to deal with the blood and it also has to deal with um, the body. When I um, preside over a, um, a um, communion table with the deacons and the elders that I have there, I used to go through this ordinance and I talk about the, um, the book of Luke and it goes through the whole synopsis and it, it says to keep this feast or proclaim this um, until the kingdom of God comes. And it talks about his death, burial, and resurrection. And so during this time of this last supper, this is a very intimate moment. And oftentimes when you get ready to go into a storm, it's almost like this period right before the flood came. And so the period before Jesus went to the cross, it was like an ark of safety for all of the apostles that were sitting there talking with them. And he was at an intimate moment. And so we would talk about the bread. The bread represents, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. This is the ordinance. The body being broken is what Christ took upon himself when he went to the cross and how they beat him, how they dragged him, how they hurt him very badly. That brokenness um, is also 
his heart towards mankind and now he has compassion for them um, even though they're in a sinful state he longs for them he did not come here um, just to seek those that have it all together he came to save those that are lost and so that's what the body represents but then you also have the blood the blood is not some type of cannibalistic carnal type of thinking that sometimes you see on facebook or the internet the blood um, represents the atoning power of Jesus Christ for without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin and so if God um, son did not shed blood on the cross then uh, we above all men are most miserable we're still going to have to deal with sin and you cannot go to heaven when you still have a bank account or rap sheet that's still counting against you I heard one old preacher say this that God has an eraser or God has a pencil um, and he uses it just like we use it. So watch this. The, the front part of the pencil has the lead in it, and that is used to write things. And he writes in two books. The first book is he writes in the Lamb's Book of Life, and he also writes in the books that records all of your deeds, for every man must give an account for what they have done while they have, are alive on this planet. And so when you do wrong, whether you're saved or not, <coughs> excuse me, when you are wrong, he writes down all of your deeds that you have done, good and bad. And he has the angels that preside over these particular books, and they're writing down all the deeds that you've done, good and bad. It's kind of ter it's kind of like a terror, isn't it? It's it's kind of like what you see in the court today, where they find the evidence of what the person has done wrong, and so they write all this information down, so that if you try to plead your innocence, that hey, I got this big old giant rap sheet, a big of this rap sheet that's going all the way down to the floor of all the stuff that you've done and you can't speak against this because these are your deeds you have to hold an account um, to that but the other part that i really like about god and having fellowship with god when we talk about the blood of jesus christ and how it has atoning power is that the other part of that pencil has an eraser oh i like that see when you have an eraser an eraser is there um and it's also used with um, equal, how should I say, equal fervor and equal passion by God. So just as he writes everything down in those particular books, um, he also, when you um, go before him and you have the blood of Jesus Christ as your banner um, 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 in your hearts and in your souls, have you been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Then he takes out the eraser and he erases all those things that you have done. So while he's writing on one particular hand, he's racing on the other hand. He knows what you've done, but guess what? I don't see anything. I'm going to pretend like it's not here all because of Jesus Christ. And so when you understand that intimate level of fellowship, Lord God, look at what you've done for me. Lord God, I don't have to walk around with guilt or shame or uh, um, um, even though I may have some doubts uh, uh, like Thomas or even though I may have um, some moments when I deny you like uh, Peter, that does not mean that you don't love me. And that does not mean that you regretted the fact that you sent your son to die for me. That's what true fellowship is like. And as a result, being the church, when you have that good news on the inside of you that you want, then you want to, as a result, you want to start sharing that with other people. You want to start uh, expressing that towards other individuals. You don't want to just keep it all of the good stuff to yourself. And so that breaking of bread and fellowship um, is very important. That's also a good way for evangelism, if you will. Um, you speak peace, you meet felt needs. Um, first of all, you speak peace. Um, then you fellowship, then you meet the felt needs through prayer, and then you preach the gospel. We shouldn't just want to shove a Bible or the scriptures down somebody's throat when they're hurting. We want to try to address them and try to just bring some semblance of peace in their lives first. And then you begin to have true fellowship. Let's go out to dinner and then maybe go out to dinner a couple of times. And then we can start talking about the scriptures. Then we can start talking about life. But if you don't speak peace to them, if you don't um, come off at, if you, uh, come off as an enemy or just somebody who is just a, um, a person who is just very aggressive and, you know, just on fire and just sending you to hell straight out the gate, then that's going to turn people off. That's not how you get sheep. When a shepherd goes looking for sheep, he doesn't scare them. He actually slowly but surely begins to coerce them and brings them closer and closer as time begins to move um, forward. All right. OK, so that's where fellowship actually comes um, from. All right. The next piece that we have as we come around the mountain here um, <clears throat> is instruction. Instruction after fellowship is important. See, you can't just be baptized only and just be on the outside. It's also about 
having a transformation on the inside. This is, makes you want to go to church. It makes you want to be around God's people. Um, some of the members stopped by the church today as they were dropping off food for our um, um, for our COVID um, nineteen relief that we're having this Saturday um, 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 at the at the church where we're giving food to people um, who are um, in dire straits. Um, they were like, "Man, I haven't feels like I haven't been here in years. It seems like it's been forever since I've been here. It's so feels so good to be here. I can't wait to get back in." And it's like I saw member after member after member, and I just happened to be there um, working at the daycare during that particular time. And so that fellowship element was so important because you feel empowered when you're there with other like-minded believers. However, we also have to follow instructions. Acts chapter two verse forty-two says that we have apostolic instructions. In other words, the church is an apostolic because it is founded on the teachings of the apostles. Not you with a $5,000 suit, having your face all in the camera talk about something. Here go my cash app, even though I'm whispering sweet nothings in your ear, but I sure know how to preach and how to tune up. Or if I'm not emotionally driven, I sure know how to speak with intellectual and eloquent words using big words that you didn't even learn in high school. That's not what makes an apostle. An apostle is an individual, and in our Tate day and time, I have to emphasize this, is one that's after the tradition of Barnabas. Barnabas was an apostle of Paul, and he was just out there planting churches. And the truth of the matter is, is that um, that's hard work, especially in the United States, where you just have to build a church from the ground up. That's what truly an apostle is. But what I'm talking about as far as the church is concerned is that we look at the teachings of the apostles. We look at what Peter talked about. We look at what Paul talked about, who wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. We look at what um, Mark talked about, um, marking and priority, all of these different types of things that you see inside of the scriptures. And the apostles are not going to say anything different from what Jesus has talked about. In other words, everybody is going back to the word. And so the word or the scripture is inspired by God. It's given for reproof, rebuke, instruction, and correction so that the body or the person or the man or woman of God can be edified so they can be made better, not just to be made comfortable or to just be smiling about specific things, but to be made better. And that takes um, time. It's kind of like having honey and castor oil. The castor oil, the Bible is like honey and castor oil. The castor oil represents some of the tough scriptures that really um, um, hurt that flesh because you know that you're doing wrong and you need to get better. And then the, the honey part, or that's the castor oil part, and it's meant when you consume it to clean all the crap out. But then when it comes to the actual honey, the honey is the sweetness, the blessings, the love, the, the favor of God is all over me. I got it. I've got it. The favor of God is all over me. It ain't my fault. Or what did I think about Master P? Never mind, never mind. But anyway, when you think about the sweetie, the sweetness or the 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 sweetness of God, like it's like the uh, the um the dew in the morning, the, the the sweet honeycomb of Jesus Christ. That's the other element of scriptures. And so when it comes to following instructions, instructions are so important because behind instructions comes obedience. When it comes to instructions, when it came to Jesus, Jesus taught all that Jesus had taught them and what the Spirit revealed to them. So. It's authentic on two fronts. When you read the scriptures and when you read the writings of the apostles, they're just basically saying what Jesus said. So if you're looking at an apostle today, they should only be saying what Jesus said. When you talk about prophecy today, I'm not prophet lying, I'm prophesying. In other words, I'm just saying what the scriptures already have said and already have declared. I can tell you your future by just reading the book of Revelation. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And the Bible talks about all the specific things. And so I don't have to try to conjure up things See that word, a buzzword I'm using? I don't have to conjure up things in order to um, elevate myself uh, above what I'm, above what's necessary. All right. In today's time, all of the offices are on the same equal footing. It's just that they do different things. It's like a husband and wife. They do different things, but actually are on the same level. You don't get promoted to those particular levels. All right. All right. Matter of fact, you see the flipping today where... It was a big giant rush to go towards apostles. No disrespect to apostles that are really doing the work of God. But now, what's happening with all of our young people that we see with the millennials and the boomers and the generation X? What do they need? They need to be taught. There is a big giant drop when it comes to teaching. And people have to learn the scriptures through instruction. All inspiration of scripture is given by God for reproof, rebuke, correction, and instruction. Very important. And so finally, this is where we get into the mission. The mission of the church is so important. And the main reason for the existence of the church is God's mission. And through the church, God spreads his kingdom already active, but not com yet completely here. In other words, the church 
is God's active representation on earth. That's why it's not going to go anywhere. And that's why what God is talking about or the truth that I'm speaking to you at this moment in time is different from a church or a storefront or a big box Walmart um, 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 building or a high steeple, a few people. We're not talking about the physical building. We're talking about a group of people that have faith and obedience to God's word. They believe God inwardly and they express it outwardly. They can't be shaken because of who's in political office. They're not shaken by what is going on with the pandemic. They still love God inwardly and they express it outwardly. And so we want to represent God's kingdom on this particular planet. And so as I close, the book of Acts, um, as we moved from this final chapter, is not simply ancient history. It is our story, the church, the body of Christ. The story affirms who we are in him. The church that started on that faithful day in the upper room where we had all these people from different types of nations, cultures, and different types of languages. There was a mighty rushing wind. In other words, God breathed his second wind into his creation. His first wind was knocked out of Adam due to sin. But when Jesus breathed his last breath, and it says, a keldama, or my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? When he gave his last breath and he gave up the ghost, he gave up the Holy Spirit to comfort us in 40 days or 50 days later during that time of Pentecost, if you will. And that's when the church was birthed because of that second wind. In other words, he breathed new life into us. The first, first wind knocked out by sin through Adam. But the second man, Adam, gave us our second wind. And that second wind is represented by the rock, the breath of God, um, the Holy Spirit. This also lets us know that we are God's people and called to be witnesses of what God did and continues to do in Jesus Christ. You want to see um, a difference in me? I could, I got people that know Dre and I know people that know Pastor Martin. I got people that knew how I was when I grew up and I have people that know me and see me now. In other words, it's a before and after picture. It's not fake and phoniness to me. This is my life. This is something that I love. I love God and I love his people. And so this is not a joke to me. It's actually very real. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. All right. Well, God bless you. God keep you. Um, this is my prayer. This is our last um, um, virtual Bible study, if you will, in this current format, in this current teaching format. Um, as a quick announcement, um, up and coming, we're going to have a couple of new things um, that's going to happen in regards to um, what we're going to be doing with our Bible studies and our teaching. We're going to be talking about Soul Therapy Live um, podcast. And so this is going to be an event where we could come together and uh, we're still going to be doing Bible studies, but the Bible studies are going to spring out of the topics that or we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk a little bit about politics. We're going to talk about religion. We're going to talk about things that you agree with, things that you don't um, agree with. We're going to also talk about other specific things that um, people really need to know about. What do you What do you think about what's going on inside of government and society today? Or what do you think about what's happening when it comes to these particular um, um, individuals and how they're moving um, um, different types of laws around. Do you think that a uh, um, certain number of people are, are being uh, systematically killed because they open up businesses that a specific community is uh, really involved within? You know, we're going to talk about these things. We're going to talk about a little bit about conspiracy theories and try to separate truth from error. The main thrust of the Soul Therapy podcast is to get a Christian's perspective, a sound Christian perspective on the happenings of the world. I do not believe that we need to be away from society. Um, as uh, my grandfather um, in the spirit talked about, I believe that you could swim in dirty water without drinking it, all right? So that means that we should be able to influence the culture and be able to express our ideas unnecessarily. Um, and then finally, we have a couple of things. First of all, we do have services this upcoming Sunday at 10.30 um, a.m. We will be streaming live um, if the order um, um, is lifted hopefully as of next week then we will be meeting in person still according and um, following social distancing guidelines sitting um, we already have a plan for that um, I already put that out on our um, Divine Truth uh, Facebook page which is at uh, facebook.com forward slash Divine Truth you can see the guidelines in order for us to adhere to that and in order for us to uh, reopen safely um, and if there's anything that I know is that Divine Truth is not only 
um, clean on the outside, but it's also clean on the inside. So we're going to do what we have always done, but just at another level. Hey, Chris and Simone, uh, Marsha, uh, her alias, that's a, a, a superwoman alias. All right. So we do have services on those particular times, 1030 a.m. this Sunday. We will be having service streaming online. Um, from the sanctuary. I'm looking forward to you all tuning in. And then also on Wednesday, on Wednesday next week is when we will have our first broadcast of Soul Therapy Live. You get a chance to see a little bit of a glimpse of it today with my little equipment and podcast and nice little pop filter and, and cameras and the like. Well, we're actually going to be getting and interviewing people from around the community, talk about different types of topics, um, if you will, um, to the glory of God. All right. So that'll be starting next Wednesday, Wednesday, um, inside of the chat line, um, um, as my final note, um, before I pray, um, having ministry and doing ministry is not easy. It takes finances. It takes work. Um, I know there's a lot of, um, ifs, ands, and buts when it comes to giving to the things of the church. But if you know our track record over the last 10 years, we know, you should know that we not only, uh, um, uh, talk the talk, but we also walk the walk. So, um, um, if you look inside of the chat, you'll see a link in there that goes to our website, which is at www.divinetruthcc.org. At that website, you'll be able to click on the Give button, which is in the upper right-hand corner, and sow a seed. Uh, we not only want to reopen, but we want to continue to do ministry work, which never stops, all right? And then if you're edgy, if you are uh, technically savvy, you can also pull up our Cash App. Our Cash App is dollar sign Divine Truth CC dollar sign divine truth cc so one of those two ways are good if you have no church home consider sowing into this ministry is good ground if you do have a church home but um you are looking for a, a, another place to give then consider sowing into our ministry to the glory of god all right god bless you god keep you this is my prayer Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We honor you and we bless you, Lord God. We thank you for your kindness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, Lord God, for these, your people. We thank you, Lord God, for all of those that are tuning in at this moment in time. Heavenly Father, I pray that um, individuals that are struggling right now um, with finances, I pray that you um, give them sustainment until this time passes. Lord God, I pray for those that do have finances, but they may be afflicted in their health, Lord God. I pray that they recover from this disease. And even if they don't have the disease that is all in the news today, if it's, even if it's something else, Lord God, give them peace and comfort and give them the breakthrough that they need. Lord God, I pray for those that are under anxiety and distress. I pray for Lord, Lord, Lord God, for those that um, feel lost, even at this moment in time, they may have all the money, they may have all of the um, um, support that they need, but inside of their souls, they may still feel lost. Lord God, I pray that your uh, gospel reaches their heart, which is who Jesus is and what he came to do. I thank you, Lord God, most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who came, died, and was buried and rose again on the third day. I thank you, Lord God, for sending him to save a sinner um, like me, to give me a new life. And I thank you, Lord God, for giving me the privilege and honor to be a pastor to your people, both near and far, whether online or in person. I pray that the word that goes forward tonight is something that they can grab on, that they can feed on, even for the future. We praise you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God keep you. Good night. Tune in next week as we go through our Soul Therapy Live podcast. Be blessed.